Good morning, good morning. This is the Amani Temple Church of God in Christ in Temecula, California. This is our Sunday school lesson, Power for Living for the adult class for this Sunday. And um, we're, thank you, and we're glad that you're tuning in with us to go over this lesson. And our lesson today is Facing Life Without Worry, Amen. So get your Bibles, and it's coming from Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Um, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we just thank you this morning. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for bringing us all out. Thank you for our families being fine. And Father, we just thank you. And we ask you, Father, that you would open the ears of the listeners today, Lord. Please speak through me, Lord, as I try and go through this lesson for your glory in the mighty name of Jesus, open ears and uh, let the word fall on fertile ground in the mighty name of Jesus. Let someone be helped by this lesson today. And Lord, we just lift you up. We praise you. We thank you this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're going to get started with this lesson today. This is a very good lesson to me. And, you know, this lesson, I don't know if it's going to be to you, but it's to me, facing life without worry. And it's in Matthew, we, you know, read that chapter a lot because for newcomers, we always tell them to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So every time you go through and read Matthew, well, I do, I get a different revelation. You know, it adds to what... Um, I always know, and it tells us that God is the great provider. But you can be the best Christian in the world. Sometimes you kind of forget that, or the enemy will come in and have you, you know, doubt is always going to be here because there's that's a tool of Satan himself. So our lesson today, um, I'm going to go ahead and read the scriptures. And it's going to be coming from the uh, King James Version. And that's Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Oh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Bible truth first. God is the great provider. That's our Bible truth today. And our memory verse says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And that's Matthew 6, 33 to 34. Our lesson where we're aiming at today, by the time we're finished going through this lesson, uh, we, we're going to review Jesus' teaching about God's 
uh, being the great provider. We're going to reflect on uh, what can and cannot relieve worry and stress and decide to express reliance on God to meet our needs. Amen. And all of these scriptures can be found in Matthew 6, 19 uh, through 34. We'll start at 25, but back up to Matthew 6, 19 uh, and read the importance and everything. And then you can incorporate the insights uh, that you gain from the background scripture in this lesson. Amen. So right now I'm going to go ahead and read the lesson, Matthew 6, 25. Uh, through 34, King James Version. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you will, what you shall put on. Is it not life more important than meat and the body than raiment? 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not, are ye not much better than they? Are we not much better than the fowls of the air? Which by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature. Who can do that? Can you worry and make yourself increase? No, I think not. And why you take thought for raiment? Clothes, things we wear. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin, but they are beautiful. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass in the field, which today is, and no Mara is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, all you of little faith? All we, us of little faith. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? 32. For all these things do the Gentiles seek. The Gentiles was looking for all of this stuff that God already promised. Uh, your heavenly father knoweth that you have needs for all of these things. 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Amen. Stay and praise God for the reading of the word and the scripture. And as we go through today, we're going to be trying to explain um, what is meant by some of these scriptures. And we all know that Jesus, he use little illustrations, you know, like he used the lilies of the fields and clothing them. The lilies of the fields, you know how we see the flower. I love to drive and um, see the flowers when they bloom, like over there on 15, all them orange flowers. And I just love all the flowers, the tulips. And sometimes I just be in awe. And I said, oh God, you know, the, the what is it? Perennials, they just come up every year. You don't have to plant them. And at a certain time, they just blossom. I had a new plant, and I don't know the name of it, but I didn't even know the thing bloomed. So one day, it had to sting. That excites me, because God takes care of the plants. And in the word, it said, how much more important are we than the birds and the plants and the lilies and all of that? God will take care of us. That's why he told us, don't worry about what we're going to wear. You know, a lot of people, they won't come out the house until they write. Some people, I had some friends, and I thought it was weird. They, they lay out five outfits. You know, should I wear this? Should I wear this? One girl, I, wear, I lay my jewelry out, my shoes, everything to match for five days. I ain't got time for that. You know, because you're worried about how you're going to look. 
what you're going to wear. Most times when I go to church, I did not lay out my outfit the night before. I just get up in the morning and whatever I feel like I'm being comfortable in, yeah, just what I do today. I just put it on, you know, shiny. Yep, I'm wearing to church because I'm not going to worry about um, the things, the raiments that we wear. God will provide. You know, we love to go. Oh, let me buy this because it's on sale and it's going to be gone. Well, just like it was on sale this year, next year, 20 years, it's always going to be a sale. It always been, the thrift store always going to get new stuff. But we as humans, we get into our flesh and we pile up and we pile up seven coats and shoes, 100 pair of shoes. Uh, I'm guilty because I have over 100 hats and I like my hats. I just collect them, you know. I don't need to do that. If I go somewhere where it's cold, God is going to provide a cap scarf for me. If I go somewhere where it's too hot for my Chicago clothes, God always provides clothes for me wherever I'm at, wherever the temperature. I don't really have to worry. We all, I call it helping God out. I have a bad habit of helping God out because you know, you know he's going to do it, but he be taking too long. So that's why you need to read your Bible often, every day. Go back and read what he said to us. How much more is he going to take care of us as human beings? You know, that he, and we see he's proven that he takes care of the grass, the world, the birds. You see the pretty birds flying by? I look at them too. Even that little thing I don't like, the hummingbird, because he flew right up by my here. But that little thing, some are big, some are little. I don't know if they're different colors, but I know it's not the same one from the other time. So, but they look pretty. And it's these big old birds that sit on top of the house that I don't like. But they are pretty. When they open their wings, they look gray. Then they open their wings and they be white. And like in the spring, uh, they be one size in the winter. They get fat. God does that. It look like they're real fat, but they be putting on some old little, little fur up under them big old wings they have. The same way uh, with my dog. When it's winter, she gets fluffier, you know. I don't do that. Even if you take them to the groomer and they keep cutting off the top hair, when the weather changes, the little hair under there. Who does that? God. It's by nothing that we do. We can't wash the dog and make it have more hair and all that. God just automatically supply that the same way he supply our needs. So the reason why I said that this lesson is very important, listen up, it's very important. And I like the lessons when I teach the classes and the lesson be to me, you know, I said, oh, okay, Lord, I need this lesson. I need to teach it to myself because I do be worrying. You know, we just forget, start worrying about everything. Oh, what if, what if it was cold in, in Chicago? So, you know, you used to just go out there and turn your car. But when you're in the cold, inclement weather like that, you wake up, you go, I wonder if my car is going to start. So you run out there and you check your car and it starts and you let it warm up. Then you forget and you just go drive wherever you was going to work. But the car started because God let it start. You woke up this morning because God allowed you to wake up. Praise God, hallelujah. Some people didn't wake up this morning. Some people woke up in a whole different way than they were when they went to bed last night. God is good. He tells you in his word, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow got problems of its own and it does. Because my yesterday, I hopped over into tomorrow. Oh, Lord, did I get a rude awakening? But I have to come back and I have to read my word and remind me what God told me. Because since I have gone through some stuff that will knock the devil down, you know, and you don't know how you're going to get out. Then you start wondering, why did this happen to me? Why not happen to you? Apparently, God knew that you could handle this situation. Now, do I always like the situations that God allows me to go through? No, I don't like them. He gave me some hard tests. And I even be asking God, now God, why you do this? 
you know, I don't want to do this. And the Lord will speak to me and let me know, yes, you can. You have the strength. I am with you. You believe, but you have to trust. It's easier to believe than trust God and have faith. You can't just be walking around full of your faith and beliefs every day. And you know, like you're driving your car, you keep on driving, you drive your electric car, you gotta plug it in sooner or later. You're driving your car, it's gonna run out of gas, oil or whatever. That's the same way we are. You keep running around and oh, you're holier than thou and everything. But if you don't go back to the gas tank, uh, you know, your word, it gets faded. And it's, it, you know, you start letting worry seep in. I'm guilty of that. I think that's one of the, the uh, biggest tools that Satan uses with the saints. Because we're telling people, oh yeah, oh, we pray for you, we have faith. Yeah, I have faith, but the enemy still comes in. He tried to steal my joy, but you know what? Jesus already told us that he came to do that. So we have to remind ourselves so when, when, when he comes and start having you uh, get worried and thinking you can't do this, you have to remember. That's when you go back to the gas pump of your word and you get refilled and you get refreshed and it helps you have a deeper belief. And when you have a deeper belief in what the words say, then your faith increases. I, it's just me. I don't think that your faith is the same all the time. And the reason why I think that your faith is because the enemy is there. He ain't gonna let you just be going along on fair beds of ease. His job is to come to steal, kill, and destroy. And he tries to destroy our belief. He tries to destroy our faith. He tries to weight us down. And especially when you're reaching out and you're trying to share your belief and your faith with other people, and I have this thing, uh, they call me old grandma and different stuff. It happened to me yesterday. I, I go up to the children. A lot of times it's the boys. So the other day there was these boys. There were some cute little black boys and another kind of little boy. And I just went up to them and I said, can I ask you a question? And they go, oh, yes, ma'am. I said, why are you wearing your pants like that? I do not want to eat no McDonald's looking at your behind. And they looked at me and I said, well, why? And he goes, I don't know. I said, I knew that. That's why I asked you. I knew you don't know why you're wearing them pants like that. So I had seen the other one. He kept pulling his pants up. They were not sagging. And he said, oh, I'm with them. And I really don't like that. I said, I saw you keep pulling yours up. But then the other little boy, his was way down. He had on nice underwear. You couldn't really see nothing, but it's still. So I told them, do you know what this means? Do you know where it came from? They said, no, ma'am. I said, well, why do you do it? Oh, because they do it because they're influenced by the people that they're around. So that let me know I got influence. I'm not just they ain't my grandkids, but they somebody's grandkids and somebody. So when I finished talking to the boys, and I asked them about Thanksgiving and I asked them to get up every morning and say a prayer. I said, maybe you don't like your parents. Pray for them anyway. And they was like, yes, ma'am. I said, every day when you wake up, you got something to be thankful for, right? They said, yes, ma'am. And do you know, I didn't know what they was going to do when I left. When I walked away, the very one that I was targeting with the pants way down there, he said, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And then they said, happy Thanksgiving to you, ma'am. God bless you, grandma. Just thank you. You know, and I love, a lot of people are afraid to talk to people. Oh, I'm not going to, they're going to cuss you out. No, they're not. Like yesterday, it was some boys over there tearing up the little cars in the mall. And I went up to them and I said, why in the world are y'all trying to tear the thing? Anyway, you too big, this for little kids. So they had, they was rocking and just trying to tear it off of the, the however it was stuck to the floor. And they had skateboards. You're not supposed to have skateboards in the mall. There was about four or five of them. They just keep getting on the car, tearing it up. So I just had to go say something. I said, you too big for this car anyway. Why are you over here trying to tear up and, and uh, tear up and do destruction in the mall? They go, oh, we don't know. Then the other little black boy started laughing. 
and he with them. I said, you know what? That is the worst thing you could do. Go around following other people, doing what they do, and then you don't even know why you're doing it. So when you get caught for tearing up the thing, you go to jail, you're going to be the first one to go to jail. First, because look at you. And he goes, oh, okay. It was a black boy. I didn't really say it out loud. But if the police would have come, he the first one up there just grinning. They was going to get him. And he was going to be treated different from the little white boys that he was with. So I told them, stop doing that. It is not funny. I said, do you guys have parents? They said, yeah. I said, would your parents be proud of you for coming to the mall doing destructive stuff? They all looked at me. And I said, I know when I turn around that corner, you guys are going to say, about your grandma or something. You guys are going to say something when I leave. And I practice that with my children. You know how you fuss at your kids and you go around and they say something. I was always listening because I knew if they say something, I'll turn around. So yesterday, the little boys, when I went around the corner, the little one that kept smiling, he stuck his head around the thing and he said, brought your grandma. I turned around, I said, I told you, I knew he was going to say that. I said, I don't care what you call me, you better not tear up that car no more. You know, and they lie. So that's how I deal with the children. I tell them, you need to pray every day. I don't care what bad stuff you're doing. Put your mind on Jesus the first thing in the morning. Thank God for waking you up. Uh, thank God for your parents. And one boy said he had good parents. I said, pray for your parents. Thank God for your parents. Thank God for your neighborhood. And I was just telling them things, you know, to be thankful for. I said, you guys believe in God? Well, love God. Act like that. If you show your beliefs, then it comes out. You're not in the mall tearing up stuff. You're not walking around with your clothes all down. And they accept it, you know? So that's my witness is to the young people. I can talk to them, talk to them about God. They're receptive. People are just afraid. Uh, you know, if you're a Christian, I don't care what you are. You can have evangelist, pastor, whatever. You're a person and you have the same feelings. You just to learn how to divert yours elsewhere and you can control yours better. So a lot of times when we go around witnessing and talking to people and we talk to them about our beliefs and our faith, well, they're not there yet. Because I remember when I was young, I thought I'd wait till I get old and, you know, they ain't got nothing else to do. Then I'm going to be saved. I'm going to go to church. I'll be the church mother and all that. But not when I was like 30. I didn't want to do that. I just want to go to church on Sunday and do whatever I was going to do all the rest of the week because I felt like I have time. So I know that the children now, they must feel the same way we did. It's no different, but it's the way that you talk to the children. It's the way you talk to anybody. You know, I, I witness to anybody. I don't care who they are. You let me talk, I'm going to talk to you. And, you know, I was talking to a lady and she said, oh, well, uh, there's one problem. She said, we could be the greatest friend. There was this old other kind of lady. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm from Mississippi, so a lot of times I'd be describing people as white and black, and they told me to quit saying that, but it's a habit. So anyway, I was talking to this lady, and she said, oh, we could be really good friends. And at the end of the conversation, she said she liked me, and we was talking about stuff, and she said, but there might be one problem. And I said, what? She said, I'm Jehovah's Witness. And I said, oh, I'm Christian. We could be best friends as long as you don't tell me about what the Jehovah Witness believe. You know, don't, don't talk to me about that. And I'm not going to push my beliefs off on you. Because I feel if I live the way I always live, if I live the way I live in front of this lady, she'll know. I think they already know that what they are reading is not, a, you know, they kind of changed the Bible. The same way with, um, I call them the John Smith people, the Mormons. They like to come around and don't tell you that they're from the Latter-day Saints because they was trying to talk to me about Bible study and all that. So I said, well, where's your church? So they told me the church and everything, them little car. And then I looked on the bottom. I said, oh, that's the John Smith people because they got the lady across the street. She didn't have no right to go to regular church. They came by and told her all this stuff. Oh, we'll pick you up and take you to church. That's how she turned to be a Mormon. And she's not a Mormon. Mormons are taught, you know, they be born into being a Mormon. And I have asked some people, um, why are you Catholic? 
And one of my really good friends I used to work with was Catholic. I said, well, uh, why are you Catholic? I, I don't know. I, we was, all Mexicans is Catholic. And I said, no, they're not. And she goes, well, I said, do you go to, to Catholic church? Nope. Once you're born into the family, you just be Catholic. The kids is Catholic. They don't read the Bible. I had another friend. She's uh, born again, stayed, sanctified into the church. And uh, everything started teaching the kids Sunday school. She grew up Catholic all her life. They never read the Bible. When they used to go to mass, you know, at school, they have to go to mass. Whoever was in charge, they read it. And they would speak in Latin. So they didn't ever know. So how my friend learned anything about the Bible is she was always watching the Ten Commandments. She knew about heart. All of them stories that come on during Christmas time or whenever they Easter. That's how she learned about the Bible. So she was talking to me about the Bible. I said, have you ever read the Bible to know what it say? This girl was like 30 or 29 or something at the time. And when she met me and she said, no, I, we don't read the Bible. They read the Bible at school. I said, yeah, you went to your Catholic school, Mother Macaulay or whatever it was all your life. And you know, you couldn't do this and you could. That was only because they were Catholic. They were following rules. She didn't know nothing about what Jesus said except for the Ten Commandments and that. So I bought her a Bible. And back in the day, oh, the best Bible was the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. So I went to the bookstore and I, those Bibles used to cost a little more. So I bought her a Thompson Chain Bible and I also <laughs> bought her the TLB, the Living Bible, so you can read it. Because I knew she wasn't going to understand all the King James. She started reading that Bible and she got so excited because she never knew. And uh, we used to always tell them after, you know, read the book, The Song of Solomon. What's that about? I said, oh, that's about all the good stuff, the love stuff. You know, y'all think y'all know everything. It tells you about marriage and getting a wife. And it just be some funny stuff if you read in Songs of Solomon. That's a good chapter to read. You're like, oh, I got to go to the bookstore, buy me a book by Terry McMillan. I used to read that. I, I don't have to buy that. I can just go on the porch and read. Like a couple of weeks ago, I was reading about the Song of Solomon and it kept saying stuff. So I wanted to talk to somebody and tell them what I was reading. So I told my friend, come here, let me tell you what I'm reading about in this book. And she goes, it's the Bible. You know, I call it a book. But anyway, you can talk to other people. You can live your life. You can share your faith. People are open, but nobody tell them. We just walk around like we're a different cult. All oh, them is the Christians. And then some Christians act like that. You think they better than other people. No, you're not. No, you're not. Give somebody a Bible like I did that girl. She didn't know what was in there. She thought she was a good person all these years because she went to Mother McCullough, the Catholic school. But no. And she ended up getting very sick and had to have these long surgeries. And she had just came to our church. And she joined our church. So she was having this big surgery. And, you know, the mothers was telling her about believing God and having faith. That girl believed God. I mean, she believed everything they told her. She read the Bible. She went to the, to the hospital and this surgery was like eight to 10 hours. She was out. And my pastor and all the people from the church, they came up to the hospital that Sunday. And the hospital thought she was a celebrity. And she asked them, if they could just sing one song for her that Sunday, you know, when she was going through that surgery and stuff. And as I put it all in his hands. She literally put everything in God's hand and stuff that should not have happened, happened. Her surgery was a success. Her recuperation was a success because by the time she was getting over the surgery good, they had to like skin graft her because she had holes in her body. And she had to go through that surgery. But because of her reading the Bible and understanding for herself and being introduced to who God is and that he's a healer, he's a deliverer, I don't care what you did, you have to believe that. And when you believe that God will take care of the birds, the lilies of the field, and you don't have to worry, if you read the Bible and you don't understand it, Ask God to give you wisdom. I read a lot of stuff at first I didn't understand. 
And then you can't just close your Bible, go to Bible study in the church and listen to what all the preachers say. Sometimes they have their own interpretation. You read and God will speak to you. The same scripture, God will speak to you. He will speak to you and you. And it will fit your circumstances. About this worry, it said it goes on to cause depression. So many people are depressed now. So many people take all of these pills and they can't get up and they got to, you know why? Because they have not read and believed what Jesus said and what he promised. If you believe what Jesus tell us and what it saves you a lot of stuff. In here, um, I was reading over here about um, anxiety. Everybody in anxiety. You take every kind of anxiety pill. You know, you got to take some whatever that is they take to go to sleep. Everybody's taking melatonin. They're giving it to the children. Get in the bed and don't worry, go to sleep. I can, I praise God. I can get in the bed at night. I can go to sleep and I can stay asleep to the next morning if I got to go to the bathroom. That's a blessing because I talked to so many people. Oh, I can't sleep at night. Why? Go to sleep. What's your worry going to do? Is it going to make you grow any? Is it going to get rid of any of the problems? No. Read these scriptures. Take them to heart. Then you will know that you don't have to take those. It said anxiety robs us for our ability to take God, to uh, trust God, to take care of us. Worry causes a lot of things. You know, worry causes people to have heart attacks. It, um, it causes people excessive worrying can cause digestive disorders, muscle tension, suppression of the immune system. And you know, the immune system runs everything. If you have a weak immune system, you catch everything, you can't heal from this, you know, it, it's not good to have a weak immune system. And worry can do that. I didn't know that, but it can. Okay, it will cause short-term memory loss. Anybody in here always forgetting what you went in the other room to get? short-term memory loss, and even premature coronary artery disease. That's all of these blocked arteries and going to the hospital, getting stents and stuff. And then you're still going to worry because you're going to worry about that. Okay. It said, however, and it causes heart attacks. However, the greatest problem with worrying is it also affects us spiritually. Worry affect us spiritually. Because if you're worrying, you're not believing. If you're worrying, you're trying to help God out, like I be doing. And when I be worrying about the situation, and oh, and then, you know, I've been told, well, when you was younger, you should have saved this, and you should have got a 401. And see, I said, when I was younger, we ain't saved nothing. You know why? Because by the time I get to the next check, I already had spent half of it. And it wasn't that I was going shopping or anything. That's the way we used to live, check to check. I had three children and nobody was helping me and I couldn't say nothing. So now that they're grown and they got these jobs that I, don't, I can't even figure out how much it is. I ain't never had that much money in my life. And their thing to us old people, you guys didn't do right. You didn't do this. And, you know, the nursing homes and all of this stuff, they stick folks over there. And I said, you know what? No, I didn't have no money to save. I didn't have all them CDs and everything because I was raising my children. They all went to college. They got these big old degrees. No, I kept going to college and dropping out. I got a couple of associates and stuff, paramedic license and all that stuff. But no, I don't have the uh, education like them. And the Bible told me don't be worried about all that stuff. So you know what I say to them? God takes care of me. You and all of your money, you could die tomorrow just like me. How do you know you're going to live? Oh, I'm not going to the nursing home. I said, if you get sick and don't know who you are, you're going to be in the nursing home. Your money ain't going to help you. They're going to take all your money. So that's the reason why you need to have faith. You need to believe what God said. He didn't tell us to save up all our money to go live in the nursing home when we get old. You know, that's worry. You worry. You can't live today because you're so busy worrying about tomorrow. And I know for a fact that God will take care of you. He will clothe you 
you know, like he do the, the little is of the field. He will feed you. Who in here goes hungry? You don't have to go hungry. You don't have to just pack rat, pack rat food. You know, it's always going to be some food somewhere. And if you believe in God, God's going to feed his children. So you don't have to have a whole garage full of cans. It's not, you can have some, but you don't have to have a whole state of brother in your house. But I, and I know some people who do that. You know, one person, they got 10 gallons of Clorox and all this. I said, this is going to get old and expire. But God's word never goes away. He told you he was going to take care of you if you need a certain thing. But you know what, y'all? You have to believe God. You do. You have to recognize God. I, I'm not saying that he's going to close and do all these people out here that saying that ain't no God. But you know what? They be looking just like us. Because when you act the fool and do all of this stuff and believe all the other religions that took out God, he is so merciful. You know, he'll let you come back and he'll take care of you again. Yeah, I've seen it done. I've seen it done. You might hear me refer a lot to Buddha. I don't like Buddha at all <laughs> because I had an experience with it. They tried to turn me, you know, to be a Buddhist making chant. But you know what? I saw people, they changed their life, said it wasn't no God told my kids it wasn't no God and all that stuff, they got sick. I said, you want the pastor to pray for you? Yeah, the pastor, he want all the old ladies at church, that's what he called to pray for him. But he was chanting to naturally whoever it is, that's on him. And in the end, I told him, I said, uh, in the end, I was just making up, you know, paraphrasing the Bible. I said, uh, everybody is going to kneel before Jesus in the end. And I said, there's one God, the creator. And I told him about the Trinity. Now, nah, they, God, you know, the God said they was going to heal cancer. I said, that God is dead. You went up there and walked on his grave. It was in Mount Fuji, Japan. Oh, it's the Holy Land. Take off his shoes. I said, but my God ain't dead. He hear right? He listen. Do you know in the end, we pray, oh, they don't say Jesus. They don't say no Jesus. They don't say amen. Do you know in the end before that man died, he had both his hands up? I don't know if he was speaking in tongues. He might have been, but, because I can't interpret it, but he, he wasn't chanting the Buddha. He had his, he was so like dead, you know, couldn't pick up nothing. All of a sudden, my other daughter started praying for him. He put his hands up and my daughter led him to Christ, you know, said the scripture. And he said, amen. And we went, ooh, he said, amen. So they said, did you say amen? He said, amen. So before he died that day, he accepted Jesus. This man couldn't even move. But you never seen anybody fall out under the spirit and their whole body just quiver and they got their hands up. That's what he was doing. And I believe Jesus took him back. I know he did because his face relaxed and everything. And he died later on. But that's what I say. Come to Jesus. Believe Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Read your word. Remember what it says. So when you get into a crisis, go to God. Matthew 6, uh, 35. Read that. Remember it if you can. Because God's word is here. It ain't going nowhere. I just told you, you believe in Jesus. You can come to Jesus and repent. He will take you back. God is married to the backslider. And if you're not a backslider, you've never been in church, then he loves you. You do your little stuff, come back. All you have to do is confess your sins and repent. And God is not like us. He will take you back. He has no respect to person. Yeah, I've been saved, going to church for 30 years. This person might have not never heard about God, ain't doing nothing. But when you come into the kingdom and he adopts you into the royal family, then you, the sinner or the whoever you might call yourself, you are the same as me. It's not like in the earthly family. They treat you as different. Oh, you get an adopted kid, a foster kid. You know you ain't the same. But when Jesus adopts you into the royal family, you have the same rights. You have the same love. So today I'm asking you, come to Jesus. Repent. Be sorry for your sins. 
He is willing to forgive you. Hallelujah. And you have been listening, if you're joining in, to um, the Amani Church of God in Christ, where our pastor is Superintendent James E. Mason. And this is the adult uh, Bible study, Powerful Living. And we just thank you for being with us today. And on next week, I'm going to give you the scripture uh, for our lesson next week. And that's going to be December. We, oh, wow. We're going to be into December already. And uh, that lesson is uh, December. It's going to be December 5th. The lesson, uh, the Bible scripture for that. And that's going to be coming from Genesis. We're going to go back over to Genesis, the first chapter in the Bible. And that is going to be Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. And it's talking about a blessing for all nations. All nations, not just us, the other nations too. So uh, get your Bibles and go through that and read Genesis 1, I mean Genesis 12, 1 through 9. And we invite you to be right back here next Sunday with us. And if you have any questions or concerns, you are welcome to contact our Sunday school superintendent. And our Sunday school superintendent is none other than Elder Otis Bryant, the Sunday school superintendent here at the Amani Temple Church of God in Christ in um, Temecula, California. You can reach Elder Bryant by um, his email. You can go to email. You can email him at Otis Bryant at amanikoji.com, that's O-D-I-S-E-B-R-Y-A-N-T at amani, I-M-A-N-I-C-O-G-I-C dot com. And he will be more than happy um, to explain or answer any questions that, I mean, any questions that you have. And we want you to know that it's as easy as ABC for you to change and be safe. A is accept God as your personal savior and your Lord. And the reference to that is John 14, 16. B, believe that God died on the cross and was buried. And on the third day, God the Father physically raised him from the dead. Amen. That reference is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. C, confess your sins. <coughs> Excuse me. Confess your sin and Jesus the Lord and that he is Christ the Savior who can forgive you for your sins. Amen. <coughs> we just, excuse me, got a tickle. We just thank and praise God for you being here today. We thank the Lord and we are asking God to bless you in the upcoming week. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, <coughs> we thank you right now. We thank you for this lesson, and Father, that we are praying that it has said something and penetrated someone's heart. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask you to just look on those that are here today in the facility. Bless those who couldn't make it. We ask you to bless the sick, the handicapped, and the afflicted. In the mighty name of Jesus, and let the word penetrate their hearts. And Father, bring us back next week so that we can get some more word. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. It's service time. <laughs>